I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Yes, Your Honor. Before I call the roll, I would like to announce that both Council Members Cosden and Law will be arriving after roll call, and I will mark them so. Mayor Gunter? Here. Council Member Cosden? Uh, <laughs> Cummings? Cummings? Here. Hayden? Here. Shepard? Here. Steinke? Here. Welsh? Here. Seven present, one excused. Thank you. Uh, item four is uh, changes to the agenda. There's no changes to have a motion to ad adopt the agenda as presented. Second. Any council discussion? Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Shepard? Aye. Steinke? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Cosden? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Gunter? Aye. Hayden? Aye. Seven ayes. Motion carried. Okay, uh, item five is citizens' input time. Uh, a maximum of 60 minutes is set for the input of citizens on matters concerning city government, three minutes per individual. Please remember to state your name for the record. If you are here to uh, discuss uh, the ordinance 27-23, uh, then I would ask that you wait until we get to that part of the agenda and there will be an opportunity for public input on that specific uh, agenda item. So any other items uh, that you'd like to wish to speak uh, regarding citizens on city government matters, please come forward. Seeing none, citizens input is now closed. Move on to uh, ordinance 27 uh, uh, 23, which is item six of the agenda, uh, ordinances and resolution. Madam City Clerk, please read the title. Ordinance 27-23, an ordinance amending the City of Cape Coral official zoning district map of all property within the limits of the City of Cape Coral by approving a planned unit development entitled Hudson Creek, including rezoning property described as a tract or parcel of land lying in sections 17, 20, 21, 22 and 27, Township 43 South, Range 23 East, City of Cape Coral, Lee County, Florida, as more particularly described herein. From the commercial, single family residential, and Lee County zoning districts to a mixed use planned unit development and approval of a master concept plan for a mixed use planned unit development, property located to the east of Burnt Store Road, north of Wilmington Parkway and Jacaranda Parkway, providing for conditions of approval, providing severability and an effective date. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. Anyone wishing to speak or provide testimony must be sworn in. So if you could please stand. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chad. All right, good evening, Mayor, City Council. For the record, Chad Boyko, Principal Planner with the City's Planning Division. This is Ordinance 27-23. This is the Hudson Creek Mixed-Use Planned Unit Development. Uh, this is privately initiated, and the owner is GA Pinnacle Cape Coral LLC. The representative is Barack and Associates as their main engineer, and there have been others that have been uh, provided uh, materials as well for this. The project is a mixed-use planned unit development, or an MXPUD. And the location is, it's a wide area uh, encompassing 1,700 acres. Uh, it's east of Burnt Store Road, north of Jacaranda Parkway, and then west of Chiquita Boulevard. So it kind of spans, uh, spans a good chunk of land up in northwest Cape Coral. Here is an aerial map and then kind of an outline of where it is. It kind of, within the central northwest portion of the city, it kind of uh, goes all the way up to the city boundaries of where uh, the, northern, the northern sort of central area stops mostly at to the north where there is unincorporated uh, preservation land, either with one conservation 2020 or, or other state-owned lands. Um, it's completely undeveloped. Uh, to the south, you have a combination of some undeveloped lands, including some old borough pit mines. 
then some single family homes and um, some multifamily here and there. Uh, we mentioned earlier that everything to the north is primarily preservation land, except for a small area uh, that is along Burnt Store Road where there are some homes that are within unincorporated Lee County. And then everything to the, to the west across uh, Burnt Store Road is uh, scattered between single family homes and undeveloped properties there. So a plan unit development for our land development code is an area that is designed for development as a co cohesive unit uh, that can be either large or small, uh, where uses and innovations in design and layout of the development provide for public benefits when compared to a standard zoning. Uh, this allows for certain things as conditioned. You can make your own dimensional regulations. You can condition what kind of uses are to be in a plan unit development rather than your traditional zoning where everything is sort of spelled out to you per the land development code. Uh, the two components within a PUD are, you, one, you have the rezone. In this case, they are asking for a rezone to the mixed-use planned unit development. And then the second concept, um, and this is optional within the land development code, but they have chosen to uh, pursue it within this PUD, is they are seeking for approval of a master concept plan. So the requests that are within this, uh, we'll expand upon those, is they are asking for a rezone of 1,732 acres from a combination of single family residential or R1 zoning, commercial zoning, and there's a little bit of Lee County zoning they're asking to go to the uh, mixed use plan unit development. Within that approval of their master concept plan, they're asking for the following. They're looking for a maximum of 3,500 dwelling units, of which 2,500 of those would be single family homes, so the rest would be a combination of uh, multifamily or something other than single family homes. They're asking for a maximum of an 800 bed ALF within this. They're asking, they're looking for a potential maximum of a, of a 3,000 student university complex. They're looking for a maximum of 425,000 square feet of retail and restaurant uses, a maximum of 150,000 square feet of office uses, and then lastly, they're looking for approval of a maximum of 500 rooms of hotel space. So there's, because it's a mixed use plan new development, you have a whole laundry list of things that they're looking for approval within their master concept plan. So some brief site history for this. Uh, portions of the site have been in Cape Coral for several years. Uh, there are other portions that are primarily within the more central regions of this that were annexed uh, throughout the years into Cape Coral. Uh, they were part of a large trust that was owned by the Zimmel family. Um, and it was probably around 15 to 16 years ago when a good chunk of this land was annexed as part of those uh, voluntary Zimmel annexations that also included some area uh, to the east that was along US 41. Uh, we mentioned earlier the entire site is currently undeveloped. Uh, there is a mix of future land use that is spread out through this development. Uh, you have mixed use that is primarily located along Burnt Store Road. Uh, you have areas that are single family residential land use. Uh, single family, multifamily land use, or SM, and then there's around 700 acres or so that are open space, uh, which are undevelopable lands within our comprehensive plan. So some characteristics of the site. Uh, it's a mixture of wetland and upland areas. Uh, given that it's you know, bordered to the north by conservation areas, you can imagine that there's a good number of wetland areas that are part of this. Um, so we have both wet, wet and dry areas of the site. Uh, there is no existing roadway access in terms of like actual cutout <coughs> ingress egress to the site. They are proposing several entrances as part of this PUD. Uh, there are currently no utilities available as this is you know far up north within the city of Cape Coral. There are Charlotte County lines that have run south from Charlotte County that are nearby to the site, but those were primarily designed and installed for the Tranquility Lakes RV resort, and there really is sort of limited capacity within those lines in order for um, any, other, any other development other than Tranquility Lakes to be able to use, and whatever capacity is within those lines is uh, far deficient for what Hudson Creek would require for their development. And then lastly, uh, the overall Hudson Creek development will include a small, a small parcel that is still within unincorporated Lake County. Um, they are using that as sort of a, a roadway connection between the parcels. The reason that there is a portion of the, of the overall development, not the, not the city portion, but there is some land that is owned by the Catholic Church that is sort of nestled in between two areas of Hudson Creek, and they were not able to annex that in. So if they were to annex in the part that they're using for their development, they would create an enclave of land within Lee County, and that is not allowed by Florida statute. So that's why you have a portion that, of, the, of the development that will not be within Cape Coral. 
So we've got here a master concept plan for you guys. Uh, we've tried to delineate uh, as best as we could, consider this is, a, this is a large development, where the various locations of development will be. Uh, we've indicated here on the master concept plan, the commercial, tr there's four commercial tracks, commercial only tracks that are located along Burnstar Road. It's around 100 acres in size of purely commercial. Uh, they have two mixed use tracks that are a little east of those four commercial parcels. Uh, they are in between uh, the central area of Hudson Creek and then the Burnstar Road frontage. Uh, the majority of the area within the, cent the central area of Hudson Creek is all designated as single family. Uh, there is some area for recreational uses within there. And then as you go further east towards Chiquita and Wilmington Parkway, uh, you get to where your uh, multifamily and single family uses will be. There's sort of like a, a triangle piece that is located at the intersection and front along the frontage of Chiquita Boulevard and Wilmington Parkway. Those will be um, a mixture of single family and multifamily uses. Um, also within this master concept plan, you can kind of see that there are some arrows uh, in terms of where their transportation is going to be. Uh, those arrows are generally where their central spine road that will kind of connect Hudson Creek throughout itself will be located. Um, they're they kind of have sort of a winding spine road that will basically run from Burnt Store to their various connections on Jacaranda Parkway, Chiquita Parkway, and Chiquita Boulevard, and Wilmington Parkway. Um, they will be accessing the Wilmington Parkway uh, entrance through a bridge that will have to cross over a canal that is over there, and we'll, we'll talk about that later with some of the conditions. So the characteristics of the master concept plan, we mentioned that there's four separate areas of development, commercial, mixed use, single, and then multifamily. They have that central spine road that runs throughout the development. Uh, there are large areas of preservation and open space. We're looking at approximately 700 acres of uh, preserved land as part of this. Most of that is, is wetland areas that the developer has chosen to set aside and keep as open space and preservation. There are two recreational amenity areas, one at the sort of western portion of the residential development, and then another one that is located near the single family and multi-family development along Wellington Parkway. Um, and then they are proposing that uh, most, if not all, of the residential areas will be gated, um, you know, sort of gated subdivision. Uh, so this is the development regulations table, and there's a lot of information on here. Um, I'll kind of just hit some of the highlights for this. Um, the, one of the unique characteristics of the master concept plan, the PUD process, is that you basically get to kind of write what your, what your dimensional regulations are going to be. Um, they're, they're reviewed by staff. We provide context and input, and then eventually uh, the developer, we kind of go back and forth on what we think is appropriate, and then it comes before the city council where you can uh, either approve, tweak, or say you, you know, you're not in favor of these dimensional regulations. Um, as with most single family subdivisions that you see, they are looking for a lot size that is reduced from our typical 10,000 square foot parcel. They're looking for a minimum lot area of around 4,200 square feet. This is not, while it may seem like a small number compared to what you normally see within Cape Coral, it's not all that dissimilar to what you see within most residential subdivisions, uh, not only throughout Cape Coral, say such as Sandoval or Entrada, but also all throughout Lee County and the rest of, the rest of Florida where they're asking for a smaller lot size. Um, the reason that they have to have some of those smaller lot sizes in terms of the way they develop is because with Cape Coral and their 10,000 square foot parcels, you're not having to account for the dedication of streets and stormwater and things of that nature. Um, once you get into some other areas, it gets a little bit bigger, such as their zero lot line. They're looking for a minimum parcel size of 5,000 square feet. Um, and then within some of the other residential products, they're asking for uh, between 3,000 and 2,000 square feet. And some of those are some of the multifamily where you would normally see uh, you don't have a lot of uh, fee title land that is owned to your name. Um, they're asking for reduced lot widths, uh, 42 feet for the single family, 50 feet for the, for the zero lot line. Uh, the lot depth is, is around what you normally see within the majority of Cape Coral. I think uh, most lots are around 125 feet deep. They're asking for a minimum of 100. Um, and then there's some other things in terms of what their, their maximum height will be. Uh, maximum height is two habitable floors, which is generally a little bit less than you know, what, we, what our maximum is allowed within Cape Coral. Um, and then if there's any sort of questions on what some of these dimensional regulations are, we can, we can go back to those later, but I won't sit there and hit all of the, the points within this. The only thing, extra thing I want to mention is you see the RV and boat storage uh, regulations. We'll talk about that later. 
but that is areas that are only for the residents of Hudson Creek, um, only for their use, not as a commercial, it's not a commercial RV boat storage that would be open to the public, it's only for the residents of this development. So here's a little bit of the roadway design. Uh, we had some back and forth with the applicant and, we, and both uh, staff and the applicant agreed to sort of the, the, the roadway design that's proposed here. Uh, your typical neighborhood road, roadway section, you've got a 40 foot right of way. It includes sidewalks on both sides. Uh, you have some area for some landscape plantings uh, within that. Um, and then they've got 10 foot minimum uh, roadways within the sort of local streets that you would find that would service some of the single family homes or some of the residential areas. As you get into the spine road and the commercial road, we're looking at a 60 to 100, 120 foot road right of way. Uh, it includes uh, aspects for all sorts of modes of transportation. We have bike lanes on both sides of that spine road and that commercial road. We have sidewalks on both sides of that spine and commercial road. And then it also allows for an optional landscape median uh, throughout that. Um, and then you've got some area also additionally for landscape planting on the sides of those roadways. Um, so that was things, what we want, really want to achieve with this PUD is to make sure that uh, walkers, bicyclists, and cars can all sort of be accommodated on these roadways within the Hudson Creek development. Uh, this is their landscaping and, landscape and open pl space plan that they have proposed. Uh, there is a number of buffers that they are looking and they've tailored their buffers based upon what their surrounding development or surrounding future development will be. The most intensive buffers that they have proposed are basically the ones that are nearby residential areas. Uh, your, type, uh, your type one buffer, uh, which is also pretty substantial along Burnt Store Road, we wanted to make sure that they had enough landscape planting in there that it would make for an attractive uh, development. Uh, there is a pretty substantial buffer that is buffering those unincorporated homes uh, to Lee County. That's buffer two. Um, some of the less substantial buffers are the buffers that would go uh, from the commercial or mixed use areas to the to other commercial designated areas, or if you have single family homes to single family homes. Generally, even within our current land development code, we don't require buffers between single family um, home, you know, other single family homes, and then the buffers between usually single family and multifamily are also pretty, pretty minimal within our land development code, and this kind of reflects that, that general thought process. Uh, for their access and transportation, uh, we've touched upon it briefly. They're proposing access from four streets, Burnt Store Road, Chiquita Boulevard, Jack Arena Parkway, and Wilmington Parkway. Uh, all of those except for Burnt Store Road are maintained by the city, so we have some say into where this access will be located. The Burnt Store Road accesses, they will have to go through uh, Lee County DOT. It is a controlled access road. They, I believe they are guaranteed at least two to three accesses at this point. And then if they are looking for additional accesses from Burnstow Road, they would then have to go to Lee County to get, to get those in the future. Um, the project will, it looks like a substantial number of trips. It is a large development. You're looking at um, a little under 4,000 a.m. peak hour trips and then a little under 6,000 p.m. peak hour trips. There was a traffic study that was conducted when this project was submitted. Um, even though those, those trips are fairly substantial, it does cover a large area of land. It's not like they're condensed into a small area. The project was not shown to have any major impacts to the roadway system as part of the applicant provided TIS. Uh, primarily that was because you have a, a spreading out of trips across a large number of acres. And then also too, because at where this is located, there is a low level of existing development. There's not any commercial that is, that is developed to the north of Burnt Star Road due to, the, due to the lack of utilities. And really the only residential development that's up there is all single family homes. So when you have low impact single family home trips, and then the majority of this uh, within those central areas are single family homes, there the applicant's TIS did not show um, any major sort of offsite improvements that were required as part of this. Um, and then the Chiquita Boulevard interest, lastly for this, it will be built uh, they're not, gonna, they're not proposed to be built at the onset. It will be built as it's sort of an access to the multifamily and PERF, I believe it was a fire code requirement. They will build that Chiquita entrance when the, before uh, the 501st single family unit is built or 501st residential unit is built within Hudson Creek. Uh, utilities are another uh, key component of the site. It's in the North Cape Coral. There are no utilities available at the site, and it really is, it's not a realistic option for the UEP for several years. So it's located within the Urban Service Reserve area. 
uh, obviously, this scale of development does require water and sewer and, and irrigation for this to, to occur. Uh, the applicant is proposing an offsite utility agreement. That's actually the second part of the hearings that you'll hear today. Uh, approval of this agreement would be required prior to any sort of development going on. We have several conditions that we will touch upon later um, in regards to how the offsite utility agreement would work and when they can kind of get building permits and CEOs for things in the, in the future. So with the rezoning, uh, we kind of mentioned the NXPUD would allow for a maximum of 25 units per acre and a maximum floor area ratio of one. Uh, we've touched upon what the requests are already, so I won't go over that again. Uh, the applicant and staff, the applicant proposed a schedule of uses with their initial submittal. Uh, staff reviewed that. We suggested some changes, and eventually we got to uh, a schedule of uses throughout the four components of this site where staff and the applicant were in agreement with what they're looking. Uh, we asked for uses to be removed that we didn't feel were appropriate for this area. Um, we've outlined those within our uh, staff report uh, and there are also within the development order as conditions of approval. We won't go into all of those. Um, we did specifically eliminate certain things such as um, storage facilities uh, we eliminated some things such as uh, automotive repair, uh, as far as I understand. Things that we think um, are suitable for Cape Coral in other areas, but in terms of a high quality development such as Hudson Creek, we wanted to make sure that we got sort of the uses that we feel are necessary and are an asset to the community up uh, in Northwest Cape Coral. Um, so we've got those uses within our, within our staff report and they're also within the development order. Um, so we analyzed this for, per the Conference of Plan and the Land Development Code. Uh, there's several conditions, there's several standards that we review this by, and I'll kind of go through those. If anybody has any questions at the end, you can let me know. Um, we found that the NXPUD is consistent with the existing land use of commercial professional, mixed use, single family, and multifamily. Uh, there are portions of the site that are within uh, the open space category, which um, the, uh, the MXPUD is not necessarily something that is compatible with the open space land use classification, but because they are not developing anything within those areas, uh, it's not applicable in terms of this requirement. Uh, we looked at whether the, the uses that are proposed in the district will be compatible with, with the existing uses in the area under consideration. Uh, we found that there are existing uses uh, surrounding the site, uh, primarily single family homes. Um, the land to the north is preservation land. Uh, staff finds that the uses that the applicant has proposed and we have included in our development order are consistent with uh, the area in, in general. Uh, the third standard is whether the range of uses will be compatible with the potential uses in the area. Um, there are, you know, Burnstow Road is a, in terms of the area along Burnstow Road, that's going to be uh, mostly commercial. So when you have those commercial uses that are located along this within Hudson Creek, we find that they're compatible with those areas. And then the, the remainder of Hudson Creek, other than what you see along Burnstow Road, is going to be single or multifamily, and that will be compatible with the areas, with those surrounding areas in the Cape Coral, as most of those areas are uh, single family, or there may be some scattered multifamily areas within that. Uh, we looked at whether the proposed uh, PUD would serve a community need or broader public purpose. Uh, the city has, do has a documented need for both commercial and multifamily housing based on studies over the past decade. So we're getting both of those within that. We're getting almost, um, you know, 200 acres of commercial development along Burnt Store Road. And then we're also getting some multifamily that is within a uh, sort of designed community that we think will provide a benefit to the city of Cape Coral. It'll add about 1,000 multifamily units to the north there, um, and then several hundred thousand square feet of commercial space. Uh, well, next, we looked at the characteristics of the rezone area and whether it's suitable for the uses in the district. Um, the site has frontage on an arterial roadway and then three collector roads. We looked at the fact that uh, the site is being approved with, in conjunction with an offsite utility agreement. Uh, the site's very large, has adequate depth, um, and we found that the requested density and intensity are appropriate based upon the overall site and location and design of the project. And then lastly, uh, we looked at whether any other zoning district would, be, uh, would create fewer potential adverse impacts. Uh, staff finds that, they're, um, th that the PUD does allow for fewer adverse impacts. We get to tailor what the, use, what the uses are within the area. We get to kind of look at what the site design will be. Um, we get to work on what the streetscape, you know, the street design will be. And we get to kind of be able to set aside things such as um, open space and recreational areas. 
Uh, it allows for more landscaping and more open space. Uh, I think the project is overall proposing around 50% open space. Uh, PUDs at a minimum require 30% open space and they've gone about 20% more than what the land development code requires for PUDs. Um, it allows us to uh, request for sidewalks to be installed on both sides of the road, which they have proposed to do. Um, and then allows for us to condition commercial uses um, and allows for a greater, scru a greater scrutiny of what we think are appropriate uses within this area. So we find that this PUD actually is a, is a tool for the community and provides a better product for Cape Coral. Uh, we've, got a number of how we've got a number of policies within our, within our comprehensive plan uh, that we find that the PUD is all consistent with. I won't go through them one by one, uh, but we outline those within our staff report. Uh, we found there was a letter that was written by the school district. They have adequate capacity uh, in the future to accommodate the uses and the students that will be generated by this development. Um, and then it also uh, staff is, uh, we find that it's consistent with a couple of policies within our transportation element as well. So we find also that within our land development code, uh, there are several standards and criteria for PUDs. Um, we found that it, it meets all the standards um, once again, we thought there's seven here. We go, through, we go through them with the staff report. Uh, there will be multiple phases within this development. Um, re the residential, as you see in most of these projects, will most likely or most, you know, will obviously start before the commercial and the mixed use phases. But th as long as we provide for sort of access within the, within the development and we're not sort of leaving pe people, you know, leaving areas out, we find that the phasing plan works for what they're proposing. So our recommendation of the Hudson Creek mixed use plan development is approval. Uh, we've got conditions and I'm gonna go through those after I talk about the recommendation. Um, we had, throughout this, we had one phone call of inquiry regarding access to an adjacent property. Uh, we had one hearing spread over two days with our hearing examiner. Uh, we had sort of like half day meetings with her, uh, both around four hours each where we sort of, uh, we presented both sides of the case uh, we worked a lot on framing some of the conditions that we have for this. There were, there were original staff conditions that are no longer there. Um, and then we've, we sort of you know, came together and agreed to uh, several conditions. We'll go through those next. At the end, the hearing examiner's recommendation of this was, it was um, something we hadn't really seen before. She recommended either a continuance, I believe, in front of her to go over something that we'll, that we'll address in just a minute or denial of the project. So when we originally presented the PUD to the hearing examiner, we had a condition within our staff report that would require the applicant to do a future land use map amendment to the transition area of the urban services boundary, which is essentially saying that utilities are being, will be uh, installed at a certain time in order for things, for commercial development to occur. What we looked at after sort of the hearing is that our conference of plan, uh, there is specific language in a policy that says, if you have developer provided uh, and financed utilities that is being proposed and they are doing that as part of the utility agreement, that acts in place or in lieu of the conference of plan map amendment to the transition area of the urban services boundary. And that was sort of the main sticking point with the hearing examiner is that her recommendation was um, for any of the PUD to be approved, I believe she, her, in, her, in her report, she thought that a uh, comp plan amendment was required for the transition boundary change. Uh, staff, once we conferred with our legal, with our legal staff and we looked uh, very closely at that policy within the conference of plan that states that the utility agreement acts as that comp plan amendment, uh, we dropped our condition and we feel that um, that concern with the hearing examiner was fully addressed or it's fully met within the conference of plan. And in fact, we have done the same similar thing in other areas of the city where we have, where utilities are provided, um, whether it's by the city or by a developer. Um, take for instance, you have developments that have occurred up by near Mariner High School or some other areas that are not within that transition or infill area of the urban services boundary, but there's utilities in place so it takes the place of that comprehensive plan map amendment. Eventually one day the site will be brought into the transition area of the urban services boundary when the UAP comes through, uh, but staff, didn't, staff after we've talked with our legal, with, with the city attorney's office, we found that it wasn't necessary to do that comp plan map amendment. So the conditions of approval, um, 
I can go through them one by one, or I can kind of highlight uh, what you feel is appropriate. Um, a lot of it is we're asking for the master, the master concept plan to be approved. Uh, number two is a, is a big one. We are not looking for any of the development approvals shall be approved or issued until the applicant has obtained an offsite utility agreement with the city of Cape Coral. Uh, no building permits shall be issued until the applicant, uh, there's two things here, they have entered into a binding contract with a uh, properly licensed utility contractor um, and then they have to provide that to us before they can get building permits and they have to have initiated substantial physical construction of the uh, offsite utility lines. So we're looking for, in order for them to be able to get any sort of home permits or things like that, they have to have a couple of things that are in place in terms of the utilities. Because what we don't want to have is you homes that are brought into this development without city water and sewer. Uh, we're not going to allow for any C COs to be issued until the buildings are connected to the city water, sewer, and irrigation systems. Um, we're looking for consistency with the, with the street standards that we showed earlier with you guys. Uh, we recommend that the schedule of uses um, within the development order is approved as part of this. Uh, the boat and RV storage, this is a big one um, in terms of it only for the residents of Hudson Creek. Um, and it's going to be limited to the M2 areas of um, master concept plan. And we're looking for a maximum of five acres of boat RV storage within uh, that M2 area within their master concept plan. Uh, we're looking for uh, building and, and, and construction with outdoor storage and display. Everything that's out, stored outside shall be screened by a six-foot opaque fence or wall. Um, we have some things about religious institutions, the setback table. Um, for the mixed-use area, the M1 and M2 areas, we're looking for the multifamily development within the mixed-use areas to be limited to uh, no more than 40% of the resulting parcel and they have to have a minimum density of 10 units per acre. So what we didn't want to see is they have, a, they have those two mixed use areas. While they're mixed use, we didn't want to see it all be developed as multifamily. So we, we said if as long, the maximum is 40% multifamily, the remainder 60% must be commercial, and they've got to, they can't just build duplexes in there. We're looking for 10 units per acre, minimum density, so that you have sort of, um, you're getting most bang for your buck in terms of those multifamily areas. Um, there, we've got some more things about the cross access and, cross access and easements. Uh, we're looking for shrubs within the buffer areas to be maintained at a minimum height of 42 inches. Um, so a little more things about, we've got some more things about the signs and the landscape area. Um, we are going to prohibit electronic message centers for the site. Um, we're looking for signs to conform to all sign standards within the land development code. Uh, we're looking for bike racks to be provided uh, for a minimum of 5% of the overall parking requirement. Uh, there's some conditions regarding uh, lighting and so that we can direct it away from residential areas. Uh, we've got entrance gates that will remain open during a local state or federal state of emergency. Uh, we've also asked that the type 4 buffer that was shown on the master concept plan uh, increase to a maximum width, a uh, minimum width of 7.5 feet um, to a minimum width of 10 feet. Uh, one thing that we had discussion on during the hearing examiner meeting is uh, within the Spine Road, they have um, homes that will, be, that will be located along that Spine Road. Uh, staff has asked that there would not be any sort of on-street parking that is allowed within that Spine Road. Uh, we're looking for minimum garage standards. And then another thing that we have eventually come to agreement on with the applicants is that if they build any of the homes that are along the spine road, we don't want to see um, cars backing out into that roadway to avoid sort of any uh, dangerous issues. The spine road has a number of sort of speed humps and things like that that will slow traffic down, but much like we don't like to see um, cars backing out onto collector roadways, such as you know your four-lane roadways, uh, we also wanted to uh, uh, try to avoid that as much as possible. So what we asked is that if they're going to build homes that are on the spine road, the uh, width of those lots will be a minimum of 50 feet and will include a circular driveway so that we can try to avoid, uh, if at all possible, any cars backing out into the spine road that at times may sort of function as a collector roadway within this development. Um, uh, we put some things in terms of what the minimum front setback will be. Uh, we know we had condition number 26 about that minimum front setback. Uh, we've heard at times throughout other residential subdivisions within Cape Coral 
that you can't fit a truck within the driveway, so we've widened, we asked for an additional uh, length of that driveway so that you can uh, fully capable park a truck within the driveway and not block the sort of the sidewalk access that you have. Uh, we want to make sure that we can try to you know, have those sidewalks within this Hudson Creek remain sort of uncluttered and available for pedestrians. Um, condition 27 talks about the applicant will coordinate with the city's police and fire uh, to provide adequate protection and response times for the development, whether that may mean sort of some office space within the development or perhaps a development of a substation with, with, within Hudson Creek. Uh, those options will be discussed and presented with our city uh, police and fire staff as certain phases are developed throughout Hudson Creek. Um, the next one is that we talked about how the project will access the site through Wilmington Parkway. Uh, we're looking for the developer shall design, permit, and construct that bridge over the Gator Slough Canal, uh, Gator Slough Canal solely at the developer's expense uh, after they get approval from federal and state agencies and the city. So the developer will be, will be, uh, will be providing at their cost the bridge that will cross Gator Slough Canal into the development. Um, talked about some access from Jack Rand and Chiquita Parkway. Uh, we asked for some additional stop signs along the Spine Road so that we can sort of uh, decrease uh, high rates of speed within the master concept plan. Um, and then there are just some sort of standard conditions saying that they have to abide by the master concept plan. So the next couple of conditions are conditions that were recommended by the hearing examiner uh, that were outside of the conditions that were sort of agreed upon by the applicant staff and the hearing examiner at the time of that hearing examiner hearing. I'll go through them. I'll provide a little background as to why staff uh, does not agree with those conditions. But since that was part of the city process, we thought that we, sh we um, it was our responsibility to at least show you what her conditions, uh, her recommended conditions were. Uh, her first was that uh, she's looking for a 30-foot wide type 2 buffer on the master concept plan, a 15-foot wide buffer along the north sides of parcel C1 and M1 uh, requiring uh, some canopy trees, accent trees, and some shrubs. That was in response to some citizens uh, that came out that were in the unincorporated, unincorporated Lee County uh, area that is north of the site. Um, she was asking for some additional landscaping there. In staff's, in staff's recommendation, the most intense buffer that is provided within the, the Hudson Creek plan is along that area that borders those homes to the north. Uh, staff found that um, that buffer we thought would be, would be sufficient for this. She was asking for a little bit extra. Um, that was sort of an agree to disagree. Uh, she asked that any of the recreational facilities, such as the pickleball, tennis, basketball, uh, pool decks, must be relocated at least 500 feet from abutting off-site residential land uses um, in, consultant, in consultation with the owners of those uh, homes that are within unincorporated Lee County. Um, we just found that with the buffer and sort of the distance that are kind of built in there, um, any extra distance separation, uh, mean, you know, it was just something we just thought wasn't necessary. Uh, she asked that at least 60% of the surfaces currently showing as impervious would be constructed and maintained by the developer as pervious services um, with appropriate city, city planning and, and site plan review process. Um, this is something we didn't include. Uh, it, it had gone through numerous reviews. Um, our public works staff didn't uh, feel it necessary to include this condition, and so staff did not include that condition within our uh, eventual, our final development order. Um, we actually did agree to the, to the thing about the city of police and fire. Uh, we've got the canal right of way. Um, the other big condition that she was asking for was that she recommended that the city not allow access from the project uh, to Burnt Star Road until that section of Burnt Star Road has been completely widened to a divided four-lane roadway. Um, in addition, the master concept plan uh, would remove one of the accesses that's along the sort of northern commercial area into the site. Um, so essentially, it means she was asking that we don't allow the commercial to have access to Burnt Star Road until there was widening that was going on there. Um, there's several, several things that come into play with that. First of all, that essentially eliminates any, um, any development of the commercial until Burnt Star is widened. And I believe that section is not looking to be widened by Lee County for another 10 to 12 years or so. So you'd be looking at, we would be handcuffing ourselves 
with a 12-year sort of moratorium on commercial development, uh, waiting on a process that's not even <coughs> a city of Cape Coral process. We don't have any uh, control over Burnt Star Road. That's a Lee County DOT road. Um, and so staff found that that was um, not within the best interest of the city in order to sort of say you can't develop commercially up there when there are services that are needed uh, not only for the Hudson Creek residents, but also for some of the nearby homes that are already within the city of Cape Coral. Um, so we obviously did not include that condition within our development order. Um, and then uh, there was also one other uh, condition that the hearing examiner had recommended in terms of she was looking for, um, she was looking for sort of buffering for the uh, bike lanes, which is means you would construct sort of like a, a concrete uh, sort of uh, barrier, uh, probably around six inches to a foot tall that would separate the, road, um, the bike lanes from the other portions of the right of way. Um, it's something that we don't normally do it, you know, within the local streets. You don't, you don't have a high rate of speed within those areas. We didn't find them necessary. Um, with the spine road, we've already taken steps to ensure that we're keeping speed down, and we think that the bike lanes are sufficient width that you won't have any sort of uh, issues with the cars that are going in there. It's not like you have um, an arterial <coughs> roadway where you're looking at speeds of 45 to 50 miles an hour along these areas. It's going to be a slow rate of speed, uh, and we think that the, bike, you know, the, the bicyclists and the pedestrians will be accommodated with this. So I'm here for any further questions, and I know that this time there are three additional conditions that our transportation staff uh, wants to present to you guys, uh, and I'm here for any further questions afterwards. Good evening, good evening, Mayor and Council for the record. Percy Zambrano, Interim Public Works Director. So, uh, Chad did a very good job. This is a complex project, the largest that uh, has been presented before Council. And uh, there are a lot of uh, conditions already embedded in the development order. Um, well, the PUD, this is uh, a rezoning, as he said. And we appreciate the developer and staff from other departments working with Public Works making sure the conditions that we were putting in were uh, taken care of. Uh, but after the hearing examiner, we uh, felt like it was important to stress out as part of this PUD that there are three conditions that will run with this development. One of the conditions is that the applicant should revise and resubmit a TIS cumulatively with a, each subdivision application. The reason for this condition is that, as um, Chad explained, they did provide a TIS at this level, which is a big picture of the impact of this development in the adjacent transportation network. But because of the sparse development that is happening right now in that area, they get the advantage of use of that capacity that is there. So if they are to meet the deadlines that they have put uh, on, the, on themselves and were part of the assumptions of the traffic impact statement, this development will be completed by 2029. It's doable, but if, it is, if, it is, if that doesn't happen, that's why we want to have this provision so we reassess their impact every time they come for a subdivision application. And then they have to be cumulative. So everything that happens within Hudson Creek is considered one development. So as they do phase one, we assess phase one. Then phase, two, and maybe phase one doesn't have any additional impact in the transportation network. But by the time they add phase two, then we look at how phase one plus phase two impact the adjacent transportation network. The other condition is to address uh, construction traffic. As you know, when we have these major developments, and th this has happened with uh, Sandoval, for example, we route the developer to use particular roadways. So the construction traffic, the trucks, they don't get into the way of our local residential neighborhoods. So th those trucks don't take shortcuts on local neighborhoods, and then also, we, uh, we want the developer to enter in, into an agreement with the city manager, so this, the, we monitor those 
uh, route they're gonna follow, and then if there is any remediation after the construction is completed, they have to rebuild the roadway, and, and those conditions will be spelled out in the agreement between the city manager and the developer. And the third condition is that the applicant shall provide for the conveyance of 50 feet of right of way for Jacaranda Parkway West and Chiquita Boulevard, those two segments of roads that are adjacent to Hudson Creek. This conveyance shall be accomplished concurrently with the plotting of land located abutting this uh, segment of roads and will be el eligible for road impact fee credits as provided by our code. And I'm gonna walk you, th walk you through some examples of this, how this condition has been applied to other developments. So <clears throat> in this slide, you see Jacaranda and Chiquita. Uh, there is an insert that, that shows the location of the development. So we are asking them to provide enough right of way to complete the cross section that uh, the original development developer of Cape Coral Envision for Chiquita and Jacaranda, which is typically 100 feet of right of way. So for example, uh, Sandoval, they provided a 100 feet right of way for a future extension of Surfside Boulevard. The section that was abutting their development, we got that right of way reserved. So if uh, at the time the city decides to connect Surfside Boulevard to Pine Island Road, which will be a, a good a addition to the city. We already secured that segment of the roadway. Coral Lakes, they provide us uh, more than 100 feet because it, it, the right of way changes in width uh, for the extension of Andalusia Boulevard from the end of the industrial park to Jacaranda. By the way, right now our CIP uh, the department is working with the developer to make that uh, Andalusia connection, and you will see some movement in that direction soon. North Oak 5, they provided 50 foot of right of way to connect uh, Jacaranda to Bornstor Road. And uh, the Bornstor Road uh, widening is considering an, an access point at that location because it, it makes sense to have that east-west connection. There is a missing link, but as development has come before council, we, we have been securing right of way there to uh, make, leave the uh, possibility open to have this missing link constructed. Most recently, the school district uh, worked with the city and they gave us the additional right of way dis uh, uh, necessary for the widening of Chiquita and Kismet Parkway, that's the segment that is currently on, the, on construction as part of Sun Trail. So we got those segment of roads. And as you know, uh, when the Rosen brothers, when they platted as they were at acquiring property, they were matching the right of way. So uh, they built half of Chiquita to align uh, around half of the right of way on Chiquita and Kismet around this property and the intent was once they uh, uh, acquire that property, they will get a uh, dedication of the additional right of way. So the city have continuing this visioning from the beginning of uh, Cape Coral. So with that, those that are the three conditions that we're recommending uh, being incorporated into this PUD. In my conversations with the representative from the developer, they're in agreement, so with that, I will stand by for any questions you might have. Thank you. Is that all the staff uh, presentations, Mr. City Manager? That is. Okay. I will now uh, open up public hearing. Is there anyone wishing to speak with an ordinance 27-23? Please come forward and remember uh, if you weren't sworn in, to please let us know so we'll swear you in before you speak. We utilize the podium right there, sir. The other podium. Over here. Um, good afternoon. I'm Gary Jenkins. I have not been sworn in. Were you sworn in, sir? No, I have not. Could you swear? Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Gary Jenkins. Um, I'm one of the residents that uh, is to the north of the Hudson Creek area. I live in the unincorporated Lee County. I've, I've been part of the, the hearing um, before. And um, anyways, uh, I've, I've worked with the owner and, and, the, and the rest of the team here, the staff. And I had just have a couple of concerns and, and would like to make sure that these things get addressed during the planning process and incorporated into the master concept plan. Basically, that the spine road leads to the road that's going to get connected to Burnt Store Road. That goes along the back side of the properties. And our properties are all agricultural land. And that can negatively impact some of our lands. Um, we're talking about 3,500 homes. And I don't know if the, that registers with y'all, but if you were to take and count the amount of homes between Cape Coral Parkway and Veterans Parkway east of Del Prado, that's 3,500 homes. And that's only a two-lane road that's going down the backside of our houses. That's a half a mile stretch. That's a lot of traffic, potential traffic going there. I know there's other access points down Jacaranda and Wilmington and stuff like that, but that's on the backside of our houses. Um, and I just wanna make sure that we get this right. Trust me, I want that land developed. Because if any of you have ever been down Burnt Store Road on a Friday, Saturday night, <laughs> it's crazy town. <laughs> uh, and I want this land developed. And, and the owner's been very gracious and very patient um, with, with, with us out there, um, trying to get this developed and everything. So um, I want this land developed. I've lived in Cape Coral since 1973, and I've seen great things happen. And I moved away. I, I've served this country, and now 30 years later, I'm back here. And I built my dream house out there. And there's nothing more than I want to see more dream houses being built out there. I know there's a lot of dreams. Cape Corals have been a dream. And anyways, I want to make it a dream. So I just want to make sure that it stays nice, quiet, and peaceful. Um, the, the owner has, has made it that way for us the last two months. And I just want to make sure that it stays that way. And anyways, the, so the concerns that we have is that area gets flooded. At least once a year, twice a year, we get, our streets gets flooded. And all that, all that water from the Yucapan gets, gets, comes out there and it gets flooded. Um, and I just want to make sure that we have some kind of barrier that prevents our lands from getting flooded. A nice berm would be great. Um, also, I can mention that's going to be a lot of traffic coming through there. We have to have some kind of barrier um, to block some of that noise. We're going to have multi-use, we're going to have commercial, and we're going to have 3,500 homes all going to try to get down to Burnt Store Road through there. And it's a half a mile stretch. And if you look at that, that road there, it's a private road. I don't know where else in Cape Coral there's a private road that's a half a mile stretch. To me, that, that equates to drag strip. <laughs> you can go down Trafalgar Parkway here and go to 20th. That's a drag strip. <laughs> there's no, there's no uh, stop signs. Well, now there's a four-way stop, stop sign there at Trafalgar and 20th. Um, but it's hard to maintain, I mean, people from speeding not down that road. Well, it's going to be hard to stop speeders going down this road here. So there's got to be some type of speed control on that road. Um, that's got to be built into this project. Because I, I, I try getting the, 
I try to get the sheriffs and the Cape Coral police to respond to the people out in the woods out there, and they, and they both point to each other. Um, and so who am I supposed to go to if I have a problem in the backyard, people speeding down the road? Am I supposed to call the homeowners association? And I know that there's language in this, in this, um, this packet here that says that the road can be turned over to the city at any time. Well, there, there used to be that they didn't have to have a traffic study because it's a gated community. Well, I know that they've incorporated now this, this traffic study, but so it just needs to take a good look at the amount of traffic that's going down this road and making sure that two lanes can handle it. That's all I'm just asking is take a really good look at it, please. I'm not trying to stop this development because I, I do think it's a wonderful thing there's nothing better than I would like to go walk right over to, you know, I don't know, Starbucks or Publix or whatever's planned for that area or even a university because I've got two girls. That are getting ready to go to college. <laughs> you know, it'd be a wonderful thing. It'd be a wonderful thing. And so I'm not trying to stop this in, by all means. I just want to make sure that we get it right. And I know that's what your, your plan is, is let's get it right. I just don't want, I just don't want language to be, be sitting there saying, well, there's only a couple houses. There's, there's, only, there's only a few things, you know, and this is, this is the most robust plan for this buffer and everything. Well, I don't know. I don't know if it is or not. Just, Let's just make sure that we get it right. Let's put, let's, let's, let's make, let's make it a robust buffer. Not, let's make it the minimum. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak? For citizens' input? Good afternoon, Mayor. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. If it would be appropriate to talk now or if, if there's no more public input. Yes, sir. You can go ahead. Th thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, we've got a little PowerPoint prepared. My technical assistance. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, for your record, uh, my name is Russell Schropp. I'm the attorney for the applicant uh, and owner of the subject property here today, which is uh, GA Pinnacle Cape Coral LLC. Um, first of all, on, on behalf of my client, I, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time this afternoon to hold a special meeting uh, of city council. I know your agendas on normal meetings are very full, and so I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, fully present and discuss this uh, project with you today, and so thank you for taking the time. I'm, I'm here today with our project team, which is shown on this screen. Uh, the team includes uh, David Kraisgrun, who's the principal with GA Pinnacle, uh, myself and Richard Aiken, who are the project attorneys. Um, the project planner is Jennifer Sapin, who will address you shortly. Uh, she's with Baracco and Associates. The project civil engineer is Carl Baracco, and he's here as well. Uh, project psychologist is Jesse Sorrells from Passerella and Associates, and our transportation consultant is uh, Ted Treesh with TR Transportation. As staff indicated, this is a request for a rezone to mixed use plan development. Uh, the location is shown in the blue shading uh, on this slide, and it extends basically from Burnt Store Road on the west to Wilmington. Uh, parkway on the southeast. The maximum development parameters and staff went over them are shown in the box on the slide. Uh, uh, Chad did an excellent job of going through the project and all its particulars, summarizing the project, and we won't, um, we'll try not to duplicate his presentation, but there are a few things we do want to address. 
first of all, I will note that the, uh, <laughs> what do we got up? Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, first of all, I will note that the applicant is in agreement with the staff's review uh, and the standards uh, that are applicable for this uh, approval of this plan unit development. And we concur with staff's uh, recommendation of approval. Um, the applicant is also in agreement with the conditions that staff has proposed for this project. I appreciate the opportunity to work, to work with staff through the process and to come up with conditions that are acceptable with both the city staff and the, uh, and the applicant. Mr. Boyko uh, covered those conditions and then also with the conditions that were added today uh, by um, uh, Ms. Zambrano, uh, which uh, w were proposed through the Public Works and Transportation Departments, uh, we are in agreement with those conditions as well and we appreciate the opportunity to work with Ms. Zambrano and also Mr. Niclario from the city attorney's office and resolve that as well. Um, but I will go over a few things in general and then I'd like to have uh, uh, Ms. Sapin come up and address you with regard to the site plan in a little more detail. This um, slide shows the generalized location of the various land uses uh, in the project. You can see the western portion of the project as Mr. Boyko described to you is primarily reserved for mixed use and commercial development and other mixed uses uh, that the city uh, I think desires along uh, the stretch of Burnt Store Road. The interior portions of the project would be residential with uh, mixed product types and as you will note and I think as staff indicated uh, there's 700 acres of the 732 acres uh, that are shown as environmental preserve and open space. Just a few historical notes kind of to put it in perspective because I've been working on this project uh, since about 2004 uh, when, um, when uh, we annexed uh, a good part of it into the city. Um, this slide shows uh, uh, the various parts of the project and when they came into the city of Cape Coral. The, the purple area, uh, which is about 232 acres, was uh, the original part of the city boundary. Uh, that is part of this project, but it was only 232 acres. The, the remainder uh, of the project was annexed into the city uh, over various uh, annexations in the past. In 2005, uh, the prior owners of the property, which as Chad noted, uh, were, were generally referred to as the Zemmel Family Trust, they approached the city about annexing the areas uh, shown in the light blue with the cross hatching. Um, uh, into the city. The city administration and council at that time was receptive to the idea because of the potential to add large unplatted uh, tracts of land uh, for commercial use, particularly along Burnt Store Road, but also uh, for a wider range of residential product uh, within the interior portions of the site. So these annexations you know, shown in the blue were ultimately approved in 2006 uh, by the city. Um, at that time, there were a series of annexation agreements that were entered into between the prior owners and uh, the city that addressed some of the future, the impacts of future development of the site, and including a donation uh, to the county of approximately 14 acres of uh, land along Burnt Store Road for the future widening, as well as a future uh, fire station or public safety station that has been conveyed to the city as part of that annexation agreement. So there was an effort at the time of annexation to look forward to development of the project and to address some of the impacts. The final annexation, uh, which is shown in the pink with the cross hatching, uh, didn't occur until 2018, and it basically connected the eastern and western portions of the Zemmel annexations back in 2006. GA Pinnacle bought the property uh, over a series of transactions in. 2016, 17, 18, um, we began discussions with the city shortly after purchase by GA Pinnacle uh, about future development of the property. And th these discussions eventually led to what I will call three major prongs of development uh, approvals that we have sought from the city. The, fir the first prong was amending the future land use map of the city to basically uh, establish the basic densities and intensities that would be allowed for future development of the site. The second prong is the PUD rezoning that's here before you today, which actually establishes the uses and the parameters. 
And the third prong is the establishment of, a, of an off-site uh, utilities agreement that will result in the extension of uh, sewer and water to the project to support this development, but also to support uh, potential other properties along the Burnt Store Road corridor and area. Uh, that agreement is on the agenda for later this evening, and uh, we'll be happy to discuss it now or later. But I, I did want to talk about uh, briefly about each of these prongs, and then we'll get into somewhat uh, a little more depth on the project's master concept plan. So the first prong was the uh, amendment to the future land use map. Um, and, and as I indicated, that they were approved, uh, that has been approved already. Uh, as you can see, the large area along Burnt Store Road uh, was designated as mixed use on the city's comp plan map. This was done on the city's own initiative. Uh, this was not an applicant initiated amendment, but was accomplished by the city uh, some time ago, several years ago. The remainder of the project uh, is designated a mix of single family, single family and multifamily, and open space, and that com accommodates a wide variety of residential use uh, within, the pro within the project. This was uh, submitted by the applicant in 2019, and the plan amendment was approved by City Council in 2020. The last prong that uh, I mentioned, um, and, and uh, or the second prong, I should say, is the PUD rezoning. This is the concept plan that uh, uh, Chad has gone over with you today, and we'll go over in a little bit more detail. Um, the PUD application was filed with staff in May of 2020. It went through an extensive sufficiency review with staff, a hearing before the hearing examiner last May and June, and is now before you for this public hearing. And the third prong, as I indicated, uh, was, would be an off-site utility agreement uh, for the project. This is an old graphic that uh, shows where existing utilities are, but uh, the utilities agreement would accomplish the off-site extension of utilities uh, up to Hudson Creek. And in bringing uh, these lines to the project, uh, the lines will be oversized to accommodate development from other properties in the vicinity. Uh, the conditions of this PUD approval would require that no further development approvals can be granted until this agreement is entered into and provide that uh, no further or no building permits can be issued until the actual utilities are well underway and there's a contract to provide for the extension. And finally, there would be no COs can be issued, of course, until the project is actually connected to city utilities. As I indicated, uh, that uh, this agreement is on the agenda immediately following this PUD hearing, and um, my partner Richard Aiken and our project uh, engineer Carl Bar Baracco have been primarily dealing with this, and they can address you in greater detail than I am. So with that little uh, preamble, I would like to bring up Jennifer Sapin. She is our land planner, just to go through the uh, uh, comprehensive planning aspects of the project, as well as the PUD plan in a little more detail. And after she does that, I'd like to make some concluding remarks and certainly be available for any questions of me or the remainder of our team. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Sapin and I'm an AICP certified land planner with Baracco and Associates. Going through the site, um, I'm gonna start with breaking it up into two different components, east and west. Uh, the eastern portion shown here, that's predominantly where the residential will be. Um, the yellow shows where single family and some multifamily could be in the southeastern the multifamily with the cross hatch. You'll see on both um, sides of the entrances to the single family portion, there's a blue area. Those are the two amenity facilities. We have those sized at roughly around 15 acres each. Of course, the green is all the preserve, and the black arrows between shows the connection points between the residential pods. There's a pink area um, towards the east, a, a rectangular sheep, uh, shaped parcel. That's the piece that remains in Lee County, um, and the road will cross through that. It'll, it'll seem as though a, a transition, um, you won't notice it, but that will be Lee County lands through there, so that area is not subject to this rezoning request. So the eastern portion is over 1,500 acres, and there are 700 acres of preserve, so about half of the site is under conservation easement. 
Um, as been stated, we're requesting 3,500 units with a cap on single family, just because that's a higher traffic generator. Um, and as I said, there's 30 acres of amenities on here and the 20 acre Lee County parcel. An ERP, an environmental resource permit, has been issued for this portion of the site. The western portion, the commercial and mixed use, as we said, we've got um, close to 100 acres of commercial as well as 100 acres of mixed use. Um, the mixed use shown in orange and the, the kind of peak purple, the commercial parcels. The commercial parcels along Burnt Store Road, um, those, the multifamily behind it creates a transition. Um, and of course in the city of Cape Coral, that's a goal to provide commercial along major corridors with a multifamily transition behind it and then a lower density single family. We've done that seamlessly with this proposal. Burnt Store Road, you'll see here that there are five access points proposed. Um, as Chad mentioned, that's correct. Three of those um, have been approved by the Board of County Commission. That road is a controlled access road. Um, we have in total um, nine access points for the project. You can see in the southeast corner, which has been mentioned as the Wilmington access. It is on Wilmington, but it aligns with Nelson. So as you exit the project, you would head south onto Nelson, crossing over Wilmington. And that is the location where the Gator slew that uh, bridge crossing, which will be fully funded by the developer. The other two um, access points um, in the southern portion of the project on Jacaranda and Chiquita, um, those two are residents only access points with the main entry points and gated entries in the southeast corner and in the western corner. The, um, the commercial and mixed use portion out here on this western side, the ERP is in process for that. Um, we've been working on that for several months and we're very close to finalizing that permit. Looking at the spine road, um, the bottom left, the bold line, you can see the spine road, how it meanders through the project. We have been intentionally included several curves in that to naturally calm traffic as it goes by. Um, there is a condition within zoning uh, ordinance that there will be three stop signs along this. This will also slow traffic, um, and it'll also help for wayfinding. If you've ever been in a project where every road is the exact same and it's very difficult to leave without your map, um, that is also part of the reason why we provided a spine road that's much wider with bike lanes on both sides. It creates a line through the project, um, all the neighborhoods, you can bike in the neighborhoods with lower traffic and then feed on to this spine road for the bicyclist and then you can access to the offsite uh, off the property. So as Chad mentioned, we have sidewalks on both sides of the road for spine road as well as all the neighborhood roads. Bike lanes are on this um, and, and again, this, this spine road provides wayfinding for the project. Looking at the landscape buffers, um, this one is a little bit updated from the one that uh, Chad brought to you. We have added uh, buffer six, um, and that is included in the master concept plan that you have. This buffer was to address the concerns of the sanctuary states, the Lee County residents just to the north of the entry road. When you look around the perimeter of the project, our main buffer is actually preserved. We have nearly five acres of preserve around the borders of the property. Um, tallying of all of the buffers together, we will be providing over 12,000 perimeter buffer plants in the areas where it is not preserved. Looking a little closer at sanctuary states, the hearing examiner had um, a recommendation in there uh, that we increase the buffers. Um, we, we do see that um, as, as something that we would we want to give to those residents. Um, the 30 foot buffer on the north side of this road, that was always included in our proposal. What we have added here is an additional 15 foot buffer on the other side of the road. So in total, there's 45 feet of buffering with the road in the middle. And keeping in mind, these are the required plants for the buffer. This being the main entrance for the project, uh, it, it will be heavily landscaped, landscaped just from a marketing standpoint. That, that will be the most beautiful entry uh, that the developer would want to do, again, for a marketing standpoint. So we have 125 feet from that property boundary of the um, Sanctuary States folks to the bottom of the southern, southern buffer. 
in that buffer, there will be uh, per 100 linear feet a minimum of 15 trees, eight canopy, seven accent, and 99 shrubs. In total, there will be 2,800 plants in this strip of roadway on the south side of Sanctuary Estates. We've also added some conditions at the amenity facility on the eastern edge of Sanctuary Estates. You can see there's one lot here that does not have preserve behind it. Um, we are proposing a 100 foot wide vegetation buffer at the amenity that we would retain whatever vegetation is in there and supplement it with additional vegetation to at least meet the buffers that we have provided. And we are also proposing a 250 foot setback for some of those uh, activities and recreation facilities that are considered a little bit more noisy or, or that have lights. Um, we list here pickleball, tennis, basketball, and a pool deck because of the lights. Looking at signage, and again, these are on the master concept plan. We wanted to provide a graphic for you. Um, these signs are a little bit larger than what is typically allowed by the Land Development Code. We are proposing two of these larger signs, one at each of the main entrances, at the Nelson entrance and then at the Burnt Store entrance. And this provides a guideline for the future so you know what it looks like. Um, really what we wanted to be able to do was add architectural elements like you see here and specify a sign face you see here of 65 square foot. Um, this, in addition to this sign, small neighborhood signs may exist throughout the development and internal to the development, again, for wayfinding. Um, and the commercial signage uh, will be in accordance with land development code. We are asking for no deviations from that criteria. I wanted to show you the preserve map. When we started this project, which was the very first thing we looked at, um, we looked at connectivity with the off-site uh, Lee County Conservation 2020, Florida Fish and Wildlife, and the Water Management District all own conservation properties around us. You can see the large arrows through here. Those were, were restoring natural flowways with both um, vegetation and then just the natural water flowway. Um, we believe this is a really great benefit, and, and especially just leading out to the waters, um, doing our part to, to clean the waters of Southwest Florida. And again, the 700 acres of on-site preserve will also aid in doing that. Water management permit, this is for the eastern side. The residential side, as I said, the commercial is still ongoing. Um, ERP uh, permit number shown here. Water quality and attenuation is provided by on-site water management lakes. The commercial will provide dry detention, pretreatment, water quality, and attenuation in accordance with the water management district's handbook. And multiple outfalls are throughout the site um, as you cascade through the site into the various wetlands and then into the, the flowways through the property. And that concludes my presentation unless you had any questions of me. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor and Council, before I conclude, I would like to get our project engineer up, uh, Carl Baracco. The gentleman here, uh, Mr. Jenkins, I believe it was, had some issues with regard to surface water management and drainage, and we would like the opportunity to address that and show you what we're doing to address those concerns. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, I'm Carl Baracco. I'm a uh, professional engineer in the state of Florida, and I'll briefly address the water management. Uh, unlike most projects, this project has received, as you've heard, a permit from the South Florida Water Management District and environmental resource permit for the residential portion, and we're very close to receiving the same permit for the commercial portion. The residential, in particular, which has already been issued by the district, includes a berm around the entire developed portion, which will retain all the stormwater within that berm, and it will be, all the stormwater will be directed into lakes. Those lakes will store the water and attenuate it and treat it, and that water from the developed areas will slowly be released back into the flowways. With regard to the flowways that you've heard themselves, you've heard from Jennifer that they will be reestablished so that those natural flows will then uh, be directed in the natural flowways. So those two things, I think, will really not only benefit the drainage within the project, but will also benefit the drainage around the surrounding areas, which I think would address the concern that we've heard earlier from a residential, a resident. Um, 
while I'm here, I'll mention the per pervious pavers, uh, pervious pavement. We do use pervious pavement, pervious pavers in certain areas, particularly in downtown areas where there's no room for water management areas uh, and water management systems. Although in this uh, setting, I would tell you that I see absolutely no benefit um, to using pervious pavement. And as a matter of fact, it would probably introduce an unnecessary maintenance problem. So um, that's what I have for you. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Just briefly, a few remarks at the end here, and then we're available for questions. Oops. There we go. So I did want to talk about transportation just briefly. Um, as staff hit it in their presentation and indicated that the TIS had been prepared and uh, indicated that everything would uh, uh, be handled uh, by the existing network. The level of service uh, analysis, uh, uh, it does indicate that all roadways will operate at an acceptable level of service with current and planned uh, widening improvements. That includes the ongoing uh, expansion of Burnt Store Road f to four lanes, which as you know is an ongoing project uh, to four lane Burnt Store Road between Pine, uh, Pine Island Road and uh, US 41 in Charlotte County. So that is an ongoing uh, pr project and that's the traffic analysis, what the traffic analysis shows uh, will be accommodated. I will refer back to Ms. Zambrano's proposed condition that we've agreed to, which is as the project proceeds forward with additional, with actual development approvals for subdivisions and actual development, we will, we will provide updated traffic uh, impact statements uh, to uh, determine whether additional improvements would be necessary, site-related improvements, things of that nature, and to make sure that the roads continue to operate at acceptable level of service. So that's a condition that we've agreed to uh, with staff. In terms of mitigation, I, I mentioned earlier that the project, uh, uh, the property has already dedicated uh, a little over 14 acres of right of way for the Burnt Store Road expansion. So that was recognized in the annexation agreement as uh, uh, partial mitigation for the traffic impacts projected for development of the site. The other um, uh, mitigation that will be provided uh, through the course of time with uh, to address transportation are road impact fees. And uh, we projected that the project will generate approximately $16.6 .6 million in road impact fees for needed roadway improvements in the city. Now, the actual road impact fees, of course, will depend upon what actually is constructed out of the uh, uh, parameters that we've, we're seeking approval for. And it'll also depend on the rates that are in effect at the time in the city when we come in for building permits on those projects. So if those rates go up, then the projection here would also grow up. <clears throat> it is worth noting, and from a transportation standpoint, uh, recent approval by Lee County on Burnt Store Road, which significantly increased uh, densities and intensities on a parcel of land uh, a little bit to the north of Hudson Creek on the east side of Burnt Store Road. So the county, in terms of Burnt Store Road and its uh, position on Burnt Store Road, it sees the uh, ability of that roadway to handle increased intensities and densities as well. Bless you. Bless you. And, and so uh, in terms of the county's approach to the, to the roadway itself, it's their position that the four-laning of Burnt Store Road will accommodate additional development. And finally, as I think I mentioned, uh, as we go through the process with actual development, the site-related improvements such as site access uh, intersections and turn lanes uh, will be eva evaluated at the time of site development plan approval process and addressed at that point. Um, Mr. Treesh is our transportation planner. I'm, your, I'm a lawyer. Uh, so if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of the uh, of the uh, TIS, I'm happy to bring him up here and you can ask whatever questions or he can do a full presentation if you'd like, but that's a general summary of, of the, how the transportation impacts are being handled. We did have, uh, prior to this meeting, some slides prepared to discuss a condition that we worked out with staff, so I will skip over this and just get to my summary slide. Um, we're here today for approval of a PUD for uh, Hudson Creek. It's been in the works for a number of years, and we appreciate your attention this, this afternoon. 
uh, some, of, some of the benefits from the PUD rezoning just on a large scale, it will provide for significant acreage along Burnt Store Road for commercial and other non-residential development that I think the city has looked forward to for a long time uh, on, on this corridor. It will also provide for a diverse mix of residential housing options uh, within the city, and that'll range from standard single family to townhomes and villas to multifamily residential. The project will require the extension of sewer and water and uh, providing, uh, and the agreement that we have uh, uh, coming up will provide utilities for this project as well as numerous other properties in the Burnt Store Road area. And as I've indicated uh, with regard to roads, we will generate substantial impact fees for roads as well as fire and safety and parks and other impact fees that you may charge. Obviously, there will be an increase to the tax base, and as Jennifer indicated in her presentation, we will provide for the conservation and preservation of environmentally sensitive lands uh, within the project, and that includes the continu continuation of flowways and uh, wildlife corridors uh, from adjoining conservation lands. So with that, uh, we stand ready for questions that are available, but uh, we'd request approval of the PUD with the conditions uh, that staff has proposed uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on ordinance 27-23? Uh, if so, please come forward. Seeing none, public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion for Ordinance 27-23? Motion to approve. Second. Uh, I guess I'll start. I uh, just have one question myself uh, regarding this. Uh, could we go to uh, condition number uh, 27? Uh, could we put that back up again, please? And while you're, you're getting to that point, I just want to make sure that uh, we're clear. It appears that staff is recommending uh, the conditions up to number 29, and then... We are recommending conditions up to 32. 32? Those are all indicated within the development order that is uh, for approval. Okay. And when you look back on uh, condition number 27, um, you know, when you when you read that, that that's pretty vague to me. So, I would uh, like to hear from our uh, fire chief uh, regarding uh, number 27 here, when it says uh, during the site development plan and plant and platting process, the applicant will coordinate with the city police and fire representatives to provide adequate protection and response times for the development. So, my question to you, uh, chief, is uh, I'm sure you've had an opportunity. Uh, to review this uh, PUD, and I, I'd like to hear from you if you have any concerns or once this project is uh, completed, uh, how that will impact our fire service. Well, good evening, Mayor, Council, Ryan Lamb, Fire Chief. Um, so my staff and I have reviewed uh, this project as it's been proposed. Um, we look at everything from the potential and trying to look at similar communities to see what we'd anticipate to see for uh, demand for service for additional calls. Um, there is Fire Station 7, which is close by um, with the proposed connection to Burnt Store Road. Um, one of the things we've been mindful of is looking at um, the just a little echo here. Uh, from ISO, from our insurance services office, we have to have a fire station within five road miles. And so looking at that, we do have a, a planned future fire station on Douglas Parkway in the future that would connect up with where the Wilmington uh, connection is looking at there to the uh, east side of the property. So in the future, uh, that fire station based on impact fees that would be collected um, would be a future consideration that we would look to um, move that project forward. Do we have that site available now? That site uh, is city owned mm -hmm. and uh, is something we have earmarked for a future uh, station. Yes, sir. Now, once a uh, build out is completed, do you see the need for that fire station to be constructed? Uh, yeah, it's something that when certainly we've had a lot of conversation about there's a, a soft spot from uh, where we're at right now as development continues for uh, 
what's developable now for the city, but then adding this onto it certainly is going to put an increased demand in an area where resources aren't uh, readily available. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Uh, one last question for the applicant um, that I had. Uh, as far as the timeline for this project, uh, do, you, do you have a approximate timeline? And the main reason I asked that question is because of the same question I just asked the fire chief as far as what public safety needs we may right. need in that area. And I appreciate that. And I, you know, we've been at the process now for a number of years, as I kind of indicated. So I, I don't have a timeline. I think it's going to depend on how soon we can get sewer and water uh, underway and ongoing up, up to the project, because until that's kind of nailed down, um, that's going to drive the, the actual timeline at the end of the day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the questions I have for now. Council Member Welsh. Thank you. Um, a couple questions, um, which is also in relation to what's coming up after this. So if I'm understanding the, uh, the water lines are being paid for by the developer on this, not by the city, and then um, the city will repay the developer as people hook up to the city water? Mike or Jeff, is that, is that what's happening? Good evening, council members and Mr. Mayor. Um, Richard Aiken for the record with Henderson Franklin. Uh, the current agreement actually provides that what would happen is the developer will extend the utilities, uh, wastewater and, and water force main, and we will get credits for the proportionate share of the extension that's not attributable, attributable to the Hudson Creek project. So it won't be that we'll be reimbursed as others hook up. We'll get credits for USEF fees and SEAC fees uh, based upon the proportionate share that's not attributable to this project. And you bring it down like two levels. Okay. <laughs> kind of what so. I was saying. Uh, is the city paying any money out of pocket to supply city water and sewer to this project? No, sir. Thank you. Sorry about I just that. wanted to make sure. I, I understand what you're saying. I also know the phone calls that I'll get later on about it, so I just wanted to make sure that that is plain and simple. Plain and simple. Not city's the city's not paying anything out of pocket for this. Uh, yes, my, other, my other question and concern is um, in the buffer zone in M1 and M2, um, looking at it, it is uh, 94 acres at 10 units per acre. We're talking 940 units of mixed-use development. Um, is that going to be uh, considered to be built first before the commercial development? Because I know a lot of uh, what this council has been pushing forward is the fact that we want Burnsore Road to be considered commercial. It's our last commercial corridor. And I understand the, the need for uh, mixed-use buffering, but I want to make sure that M1 <coughs> and M2 aren't just going to be a bunch of apartments. So. Could someone explain to me, um, in these 90 acres, what, what kind of development could we see here in this? What are the residents going to be seeing uh, as this goes through? Hi, again, for the record, Jennifer Sapin. The, so development timing in general, um, it's the, the, the adage is you, you build the rooftops um, come first, and then the commercial follows that. Now, with Cape Coral, it's unique that there are already some rooftops out there. Um, but we do anticipate the single family to start first. Um, and, and there has been quite a lot of interest for commercial. As you know, there isn't a lot of commercial out there, in large part due to the lack of utilities. Once that goes out there, we do expect the commercial to go first, um, or the, the single family to go first, followed by the commercial, and then the apartments after that. But there isn't any condition specifically um, uh, outlining the phasing. However, staff does have a condition, and the future land use of the mixed use um, you cannot use all of the mixed-use area as, um, as multifamily. Um, there's a percentage, I believe, is it 40% or 60% is the cap? Uh, it's 40% within the M What 40% within, within the mixed-use area. So I believe it was, um, what, 88 acres of the mixed-use, so 40% of that um, at 10 units an acre. And there's overall cap, too. Yeah. Right. Okay. Go ahead and, and then please. my last. Yeah, just additionally, too, yeah, so you've got, You've got 90 acres or so of the M1 and M2 area. Only 40% could be multifamily. 
And on top of that, throughout the entire Hudson Creek, you have a cap on multifamily of 1,000 units. So there will be spreading out of those multifamily units between the, the mixed use area and then the area that is located further to the east. Okay. So it will, it, the concern of the 90 acres of the M1 and M2 going full multifamily, uh, can't, it can't occur. They can only go up to 40% of that. And then there's other caps that limit how much multifamily they can do without the, within the entire development. Excellent, thank you. And then my last uh, question is, during construction of this, um, did the city take in uh, any sort of concern as to where construction vehicles are be coming in on these roads and usage of the roads? So I know we've got a lot coming in off uh, Wilmington and Chiquita, but is the plan to use Burnstor Road as the main construction entrance or Wilmington and Chiquita, and are they planning on repairing the roads um, if they do use the Wilmington entrance? Because I know that up there has been, um, it's not really scheduled for paving, it's not something that the UAP has come to, and if we bring a bunch of dump trucks in for this development, I wanna make sure that we're utilizing the county roads uh, for that uh, before approving this. So has that been taken in, into consideration? We will look into it as they come with uh, their facing. As they pull permits, we will look into uh, uh, which will be the routing for construction traffic. Our preference, of course, is Burnstone Road. We did something similar with Sandoval for the last phase. That was uh, the last single family residential. We asked them to use uh, the entrance on Pine Island Road, and we even asked the developer to build a temporary roadway of Pine Island Road, because at the time, Sandoval wasn't connected to Pine Island Road. So we always look into it, and we try to channelize that heavy traffic to, through the major roadways. Here, uh, Burnstone Road is the one with the highest hier hier hierarchy. So that will be the one that will be our preference. So that is included in this? We don't have, because right now they just have this Overlay. vision for the entire site. Okay. So as they come with portions of the development, we will work with them on how we route the traffic. And then as we're dealing with traffic now in other communities like Entrada, is there anything that we can do as a city for requiring a uh, stoplight or is because this is a county road that would be a county thing out there and is there any sort of plans in the future involving uh, so, some sort of stoplight since uh, Burnstone road is a county road they will have to go through uh, what is called a, a development order process they have to request a driveway connection and as part of that process they have to provide tra traffic data uh, they will have to do improvements. Uh, I think if the roadway is no four lane, depending on what they're proposing, I'm pretty sure Lee County is gonna ask them to put uh, turn lanes at the approaches to that uh, connection to Burnstone Road. So Lee County will look carefully into it. And typically they coordinate with us. Yeah, I just wanna make sure that we're getting this all now in the beginning. And because that's why as, that's as we've correct. seen with uh, what's happened with Entrada and some of the other Bella Vida up on, on the north end of Del Prado, we're dealing with it after the fact. So not that I'm against this in any ways, I just wanna make sure that we're preparing for the future. So I'm glad to hear that it is a county, uh, it's a county thing and hopefully they're on it and they're, they're paying attention to what's about to happen. And uh, furthermore, I'm in support of this. I think it's a great, uh, development to come into Cape Coral, and uh, I'm glad you guys are here to provide us all this information. Thank you. Madam City Attorney. Thank you. Um, I have asked Mr. Naclario from my office to check off with you the conditions of approval to make sure that none of them have been missed and that we're all talking the same ones going in. Yes, so the conditions are all the way up one through 32, if I recall correctly. I Mayor, for the record, John DeClaire, City Attorney's Office. There's 33 conditions, 33. not 32, that was set on the record. The ordinance before you has 33 conditions. And then I just wanted to make sure, because the uh, motion did not include the three additional recommended conditions. So there would be 33 plus three 
if that's to the pleasure of the council. Thank you. And our motion maker, uh, would you like to revise your motion to incorporate that? And the second, agree with that? Okay. All right, Council Member Steinke. Thank you. Uh, and uh, first, let me say thank you for uh, preparing all the information in an easy, understandable way and the amount of information that you gave to let us uh, formulate any questions we have and um, uh, be prepared to make a good decision. I, I too, uh, uh, speak favorably uh, as it relates to what this uh, development will bring to our city. Um, and, and much needed uh, commercial services up in that, in that area, which we don't have today. Um, I do have a couple questions. One of them was uh, very similar uh, to Councilmember Wel Welsh's, and that's as it relates to the uh, traffic control devices. Um, is there anything, uh, and, I, and I couldn't find it, uh, but is there anything that says that those traffic control devices um, must go in at a particular juncture of the development? At this time, it's too early to tell because what they're, uh, again, they're coming for this vision for us rezoning and we did an assessment based on their uh, um, prediction. They think they might be built out by 2029. So based on that, that information, a TIS was developed. So at this moment, uh, there are no of uh, additional traffic control devices required because the existing capacity that is out there is enough to handle the traffic that they're gonna produce. But we know we're in influx, we're getting more development, that's why we're asking to revise that TIS, that, that traffic impact statement every time they come for a permit in a cumulative way so we can reassess the situation. Okay, well, just we've seen that by allowing the timing to be um, when we need it, now let's, now let's plan it. We know that it's a year down the road before we get one, and then we have to deal with a year's worth of problems at the intersection. And so what I'm hoping is that we're more proactive with that traffic study that, that says that um, a year from now, we will need this, so let's get it started now so the traffic control device is there for the safety of our, of our citizens rather than, okay, now it's been identified that we need it, let's get started now and it gets there a year later. Does that make sense? I, I hear you, I hear you, uh, but the way this, this approval is being set up, right now you're just doing you are at the rezoning stage. You are not approving pre-platting, you are not approving any other particulars that will uh, lead to vertical development. They still, they have a long way to go. They still have to pull out other permits. They have to do the infrastructure. They have to do the platting. So once they do the platting, the subdivision, when they come for subdivision, and they request a permit for to build the infrastructure. That takes time. At that time, based on that subdivision and that, those densities and intensities, we will do a traffic analysis again. And then as part of that permit, uh, then we will assess what are the needs and uh, we will plan accordingly. Okay, thank you. Uh, and my, my last uh, question, uh, it, it relates to, I think something was mentioned about um, uh, one of the entries just being a private residence entry. If it's just a private residence entry, then obviously it would need some type of a gate uh, that would not allow any entry other than residence. Um, and so my wonderment was, will all of the uh, entrances be gated and in condition number 29, it says that gates on the access points shall be optional. So how can it be optional if it will only be a residence entry? Mm -hmm. 
That was, I, th I mean, I think when they said private entrance in the sense that it would only be for the, I mean, they can, <coughs> you can change that to a, make it required to have a gate on there. Staff doesn't normally require, I mean, it's not our typical policy to require that you must in gate an entrance. If the applicant wants to say that it's only going to be for a private residence and that they are going to gate it, that's fine. But in terms of a, an imposed condition as part of a PUD, it, it's not typically our policy for them to, for us to state, you have to put an entrance gate up into your property. I don't know if that kind of makes it clear. We, I mean, we just so, we want their, the condition 29 was really to make sure that they revise their master concept plan to show those access points from those two locations, which they have done as part of this condition. And then from staff's perspective, if they wanted to gate them, they could, <coughs> but we don't usually require a gate there. They've stated that it'll be residents only, so presumably they will make sure that it's gated. And the, and the only reason for my question is, is that I, I know that there has been a demand um, as people move into our area. There's been a, 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 a greater demand for gated communities um, that, that we don't have a whole lot of. And I, I, I saw this as a breath of fresh air until, until I saw uh, that gates were going to be optional. Uh, and so that's, that was the question. Not a, not a, a turning point for me, yeah. uh, just a question. <coughs> and and uh, this brings to my attention something that I don't know if that was clear, that the roadway system inside this development is to be maintained by that development. These are in public roadways. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Hayden. Thanks, Mayor, and I guess this question might be for the developer, but this particular project has a couple of intriguing parts to it, one being the 800-bed assisted living facility and the other being the 3,000-student university, which would be a fairly large school um, in that area. Can you explain a little bit um, the vision of that? You know, we've, we've been through this before with other parts with other property in Cape Coral about <coughs> a branch ca campus or a satellite university? Are there currently any discussions going on with any schools? And number two, does this impact the zoning at all? Because typically a university is zoned institutional, and that doesn't seem to be part of this particular PUD. Thank you again, Jennifer Sapin for the record. Our schedule of uses for commercial right now was we just kind of grabbed anything that we thought potentially might be here. Um, you know, what we see going out here first is probably more of a, a grocer type retail, uh, maybe with some strip. And then after that, we'll figure out what the market needs. Um, I, we haven't been in discussions yet with, with any universities of any kind of serious talk, um, but we do think that's a use that has a potential here. So we wanted to have it included as our schedule uses as an option. Um, now, I, as we've talked a lot about traffic, uh, traffic studies would need to be done. Any type of conversion from a retail to a university or to a restaurant or to a hotel or between these different types of uses is traditionally done based on <coughs> traffic generation. Um, X square foot of retail equals X bedrooms of hotels, that type of thing. So at this time, no, we don't have any uh, real plans for a university, but we didn't want to exclude any possibilities um, from this great property. So would you have to come back before us for a zoning or future land use change should a university be interested in coming to the site? I don't believe so. I believe we should be, we could handle that with staff administratively. Um, by the council here approving those as a possible use, then that use would be allowed. And then we would just work together with staff on the traffic conversions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. A uh, Couple more comments I had as well. Uh, council member Long, I'll let you go first. Oh, since okay. it, uh, Just real quickly, I wanted to ask uh, two things. To elaborate a little more that kind of the path that you were going down uh, when we were talking about traffic signals, uh, if at any point uh, during a traffic study it's determined that a traffic signal needs to be installed, who pays for it? That, if, if it is generated by them, it will be the developer. So what we do typically uh, as part of the traffic analysis, we do uh, an assessment who triggers the traffic in which percentage and when we split the bill pretty much 
So For example, is. the traffic signal at 24th and Pine Island Road, that development on the north east corner, he pay a proportional share of that traffic signal. Mm -hmm. They build it, and then we gave them you know, their proportional share. And the reason I asked that question, you know, we all just recently had a discussion about Estrada and Trada, and um, we don't want to find ourselves in that position Correct. again. So have we put a mechanism in place so we don't find ourselves in that position again? Well, I think he, with this particular development, we are not getting to that level of detail that we did when we approved Entrada, because that was the issue. When you approve Entrada, uh, at that time, as part of the development order, there was a subdivision approval already embedded in the, uh, in, in the whole process. So you want to address everything because that's, that is your opportunity to catch them. So that's right. Uh, that's why staff try to address future traffic signals, and that's the dilemma because you can know, you could, but uh, I'm not sure there was willingness from council for, to ask a developer to pay 20 years in advance for something that was going to be warranted into the future. So that's why those conditions are read uh, of, of a traffic signal when warranted. Okay. So a, a better mechanism, and I think, moving forward when we get up to that level is to get the money up front. Mm -hmm. And then the city is in, in, in charge to put the traffic light when it's warranted. So I think we learn a lot with uh, this experience with Entrada. Okay. And lastly, um, if we could put the, uh, the chart up that showed the 4,200 square feet for the... Uh, I believe it was single family and, and what the square footage for, for the lots were. And while you're putting that up, um, and I know you mentioned it, uh, Chad, in your, in your presentation, but, you know, you have two or three developments that come to mind in Trotta that we just spoke about. Uh, you got Coral Lakes. I know there's another one up there. I, I can't remember the name. And then we have uh, Sandoval. So looking at those projects, uh, because I think we've all probably been to one of those projects at some point in time, so it will help us uh, with a vision when we're taking a look at this particular project. The 4,200 square feet and, and uh, semi-detached, 3,000, and, uh, you know, as noted here, uh, comparing it to those neighborhoods, is that pretty similar? It is. I, I think you're talking like a fraction of like 100 square feet, 200 square feet. I think Sandoval, uh, I didn't work on it, but I believe theirs are around like 44, 4,500 square feet for their single family lots. Um, they usually, you know, you, the typical for these subdivisions is they, na they um, narrow their width down a little bit so you don't have like, you know, giant side yards, but they still keep them fairly deep so that you have some sort of backyard for their residents. Um, but yeah, they don't, they're, they're roughly the same size. I'm not entirely sure what Entrada is, but most of these subdivisions, when they're master planned out, that's when they have to dedicate things for rights of way and open space and stormwater and things like that. You, you find that it's typically done this way. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, if you're talking, the difference is it's when 100, 200 square feet or so. And then with a single family cemetery attached, uh, those are the ones where you have like townhomes mm -hmm. where you're limited on what your actual land ownership is. You might have, um, you might have your, you know, your 1800 square foot unit and then a little bit of, uh, cell phone land, but then the rest of it is, you know, common, common elements. Okay. Council member law. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. You actually just, your final point touched on one of my, my points was just how, how the city bridges the gap between, you know, our standard 10,000 lot site and our uh, square foot lot site and then the 4200 but that that makes a little bit more sense um one of the questions i had and i know he, the de oh, developers representative briefly addressed it but i don't know that i understood it completely what, what's being done to make sure that we um address the, sh the sheet flow from the, the yucca pens with regards to flooding and those sorts of matters again for director carl baracco when we went through the uh process with the South Florida Water Ministers, we met with several different environmental groups and we met with the uh, district uh, and we considered all of the water coming from the east to the west and through the 
flowways and all those flows were considered and were documented in the in the process at the South Florida Water Management District. So how are we handling it? I mean, are you doing berms or are you doing, I understand they were considered, but what, what does that mean? What does that entail? How do you address it? Well, we delineated the flowways and uh, made sure that they would be opened up and they would be, um, a, a lot of the problem is the friction when in, in the surface when there's a lot of vegetation that's unmaintained. So now all of the flowways, at least within this development, will be maintained in a more natural condition and will more freely pass water as it did years ago. Okay, thank you. Uh, next point is I saw in the developer's presentation that they had mentioned uh, or they had shown a, let's just call it a schematic of a median and it was landscape. And then there was another portion that showed that that landscape, that median landscape was optional. Can we? It would probably be this. Yep, so that there is the optional, and then we were presented with a slide that actually showed the median landscaped. Uh, that was during this one. Yeah. I think, are you referring to the color graphic that I had up? That would make sense, yes, ma'am. Um, so the the buffering that would be required um, are those specified oh, um, how many trees 14. or shrubs per 100 linear feet. The other vegetation that is shown in this, there it is, shown in this graphic um, is really just for graphical purposes only, but extremely likely. As I said, this is the main entrance. Um, the developer is going to put a significant uh, financial interest in sure. this. So they're going to make sure that they, they go above and beyond the code minimum landscape requirements. Uh, we've got about a shrub every foot, um, uh, 15 trees per 100 linear feet. So that's the absolute minimum. The other trees shown in here are really just what we would really truly expect to happen but would not be required. Right, so that's, that was my point is there's a yeah. distinction between Absolutely. extremely likely Correct. and obligated. Correct. It, well, in the um, required trees, um, those are needed to be uh, native species, things like that. So the city has more control over the required buffering. Okay, so just to be clear, you could move forward without putting anything in the medians. I know that's it's not a great business decision, I guess, <laughs> from your perspective, but that's correct. as far as the pledge requirements, it's not required. That's, I believe that's correct, what's been yes. shown here. Okay, and then my last point is, and I think it's one of your slides, uh, slide 26. So it's touted here, uh, the third point that the, that's gonna require, which has obviously been said, the extension of sewer and water, which provides utilities for the project and numerous other properties uh, in the Burnt Store Road area. But I didn't see where that was clearly defined, where and how that, that you, those utilities were going, to, the navigation of those utilities. That makes a big distinction between whether it's useful for those properties in the Burnt Store Road corridor or not. And all kinds I know of I've people seen coming a couple up different to answer this. <laughs> Line them up. Jeff Pearson, Utilities Director. Council Member Long, we uh, wanted to wait and have it to be determined. Uh, we didn't want to lock ourselves in with a particular route for the utilities. Uh, we will make that determination once we select an engineer for North 3 UEP. Uh, and run hydraulic modeling to find the, the best possible route for the lines. The majority of the lines will be along the Burnt Store Road corridor. I do know that uh, because we want to provide um, future you know, water and sewer services for potential commercial uh, and residential development. Uh, we do have um, uh, casings already under Burnt Store Road where it's been widened, uh, where we can slip lines in uh, across to the other side of the road. Uh, we envision that there will be um, other lines, smaller diameter lines potentially, because this, the lines that uh, the Hudson Creek developer will be putting in will be backbone transmission lines for that entire corridor. 
So there will be branches off those lines in the future to service uh, that entire corridor from this new main that they'll be uh, funding and installing. So uh, that's really to be determined, the exact route, uh, and that's why we, we didn't want to lock ourselves into a t particular route. We want to get the biggest bang for the buck uh, because we will be, we're not funding it out of pocket, if you will. We are giving SEAC and CFEC credits so in some ways we are paying for it, but we're not paying for it up front. So uh, we will, the city uh, staff and with our engineering consultants, will work with uh, Baracco and Associates to determine that final uh, alignment for this transmission main and uh, in the future. Yeah, I mean, th that's my point, is, is when you say we, I'm assuming you're referring to the city and the bank for the buck. So the, to be determined, it makes me a little uneasy because uh, we've seen in the past that, actually, we just talked about it, there's a difference between it makes sense or it's likely to, and there, there's an actual uh, memorialized commitment to that. And the reason I say that is because it's in our best, to me, selfishly, one of the appealing things to this project is the ability to run the, the utilities extension up our store road and activate those commercial sites in that corridor. And so if we sit here and say, well, we'd like to do that, or it's TBD, or that's something that we can consider. Uh, that's one thing, but if it's cheaper for the developer and there's no obligation in any of these agreements for them to run it up Burnt Store Road and they decide they want to go up Old Burnt Store Road, that doesn't serve the purpose that I just described at all. So I can, I can show you what we have in the um, prior documents that we prepared for the master plan. I have it up right now. Uh, this shows we would connect conceptually in the vicinity of Embers Parkway and Chiquita. At that location, we have a 24-inch potable water main at this time and a 16-inch wastewater force main. Uh, and the way we have it that we presented it in the master plan that's in the current uh, master plan would be to run down embers and then go north up to this development along Burnt Store Road. Um, and in the future, uh, what we would also need uh, most likely in the Hudson Creek development along that spine road, they would have to put in a larger diameter main th uh, in that location. And then that would potentially connect and again, this is all conceptual, we would connect that to the North RO plant. That would provide a higher level of reliability to this area because it would be fed from two different lines. And then in the future, a phase two potentially would be another wastewater main, force main running that green line here. Uh, on the east side of the development running back down to a large diameter force main um, that's already in the North 2 area. So there's a lot of different variations um, and I, we didn't want to lock ourselves into a particular route because we may find later on once we run the hydraulic modeling and the engineering that may not be the best exact way to go with them. So. Uh, Paul can speak more as far as the UEP. And um, thank you, Paul Klingen, uh, CAP director. And you can see that that gap uh, where Jeff was explaining on Burnstow Road at Embers, that would be filled in during the North 3 UEP as far as lines down to North 2. So you would Sure, but that, bri but that bridge between the, nor the top of the North 3 um, and, and the southernmost part of the Hudson Creek, what just for perspective, where would that lie if Hudson Creek didn't exist in our, in our utilities master plan? How, how long would it take us to get up that far north? If Hudson Creek wasn't happening as part of North 3, we'd have at least water, sewer, and irrigation up Burnstall Road on that, probably that west side. All the way up, past uh, North 3? At least, well, to North 3. Okay, so that was my question. But north of North 3, how, how long, how far out is that on the plan? Uh, that would be, then that was, I think, North 11, I yes. Yeah, north. So that's so, the benefit here to me is what I'm trying to get at. 
is part of the reason of this that at least to me has been sold is there's obviously a ton of benefits, but one of them is that we're going to be able to bridge that gap in yes, commercial we, utilities. With, with North what I'm not three, seeing is how that's clearly defined. With North 3 design and that construction coinciding at the same time as Hudson Creek, we will have utilities for water and sewer up Burnstore Road. So that was just one particular layout. Like I said, that gap below that, between North 2, that would be filled in uh, as part of North 3. But there's also a possibility that we might have a connection from Hudson Creek down to North 2, through North 2, down uh, the force main that takes it to the South Plant. So those details are to be worked out, but between the two projects, uh, Burnstore Road will have water and sewer on one side. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to elaborate a little bit, which you had, uh, to, oh, I'm sorry. Could I, could I address briefly, Richard Aiken sure. again for the record, I just would like to address Council Member Long's question real quick because I think I can answer it. So the agreement right now, and it's paragraph 8A, uh, little i and little ii, utility agreement basically provides that the extension of wastewater force main and any ancillary infrastructure as required, and right now it says, on Old Burnt Store Road to the property along a route to be determined by the city to, to design specifications established and provided by the city. We discussed this with staff today. The, the a route along Old Burnt Store Road was originally what the city had requested. We're fine taking that language out. The point would be that the, where it's gonna go is not up to the developer, it's gonna be up to the city. So if the city utilities department says we want it to go down Burnt Store Road, that's where we're gonna put it. So I think that, I hope that maybe answers I your question. Yeah, you can appreciate what I'm saying, and we could technically hold you hostage under that provision if we wanted to. I just wanted to kind of approach that at this point as well so that it's clearly understood that it's my desire that that's where we go if it's scientifically possible. Understood. Thank you. Yeah, uh, one last thing I wanted uh, to ask and elaborate a little more that uh, you brought up uh, with the medians in the, uh, uh, in the project. Now, my understanding, uh, we're going to have dual water, correct, in this project? Or is it, I see Chad shaking his head, yes. Yeah, it'll, it'll have, I mean, city water sewer irrigation like you have throughout yep. the city. So I kind of agree with uh, what Council Member Long said. I think it wouldn't hurt to have a minimum requirement uh, for the medians in this project if it's just uh, grass and, and uh, um, irrigation. And that way the mediums look good. You know, right now, the 11th hour it might be a little difficult to come up with a medium plan on, on trees and shrubs, but uh, at least as a minimum requirement, you know, to have irrigation and, and uh, grass. I, I, I do believe, and I, I mean, I'm not, I don't deal with landscaping and medians, but I think if you're putting landscaping within the median, there would be a requirement within our landscape code to make sure there's irrigation in there. Yeah, but even it, it's optional. It's, the, the, the landscaping, the landscape median itself is optional within what they proposed within their, within their streetscape plan. Right. So that's why I was just kind of going the direction I was going in. I would put that in as maybe another condition as a minimum requirement would at least be grass and, and irrigation in the medians. So that I would support something like that if, uh, if anyone else wanted to uh, discuss that. Keep in mind, those roadways are private, so it's up to the developer. And you see in uh, the gated communities we have in Cape Coral, those developers tend to put landscaping in their medians. But you can add that condition if yeah. you wish. And I think you know they may even have that desire, uh, because it sounds like they're trying to make this a, a nice, uh, appeasing community. Hi, uh, we, we have spoken with a property owner and we would be agreeable to a condition of a sodded landscape median with irrigation. Okay, all right. So would the uh, motion maker like to make that uh, condition number 34? Wasn't it already a sodded medium yeah. anyway? Option. <clears throat> I'm not sure what would be required, but the, de the developer is definitely going to sod and, and irrigate that. So th we, would be, we would agree to the condition. Okay, yeah, we can, so that would be condition number 37, right? Yeah, 
Yep. So the way the motion now reads is approval of ordinance 2723 with 37 conditions, the 37th being sodded and irrigated median. Second. Second, agree to that? Yep, yeah. okay. All right. Any other discussion? All right, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Shepard? Aye. Steinke? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Austin? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Center? Aye. Hayden? Aye. Long? Aye. Eight ayes. Motion carried. Okay, we'll move on to item seven. It is the consent agenda, uh, but I think it's important that we at least have a discussion on it, uh, which is resolution 79-23. Uh, Mr. City Manager. Mr. Pearson will present this item. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Jeff Pearson, Utilities Director. The developer's uh, off-site utilities agreement that you have before you this evening uh, is with the GA Pinnacle, Cape Coral LLC, who is the owner of the property. They are proposing to develop this large track of land known as Hudson Creek and the uh, Hudson Creek development as has been previously stated is going to require certain offsite improvements to the city's potable water transmission and wastewater transmission systems in order for this project to connect to our utility systems before this property can be developed the developer will be responsible for extending large diameter wastewater force mains and potable water transmission mains that will become a backbone utility system that will serve the Burnt Store Road commercial corridor and future UEP areas as envisioned in the 2022 Utilities Master Plan. The developer agrees to extend the city's water and wastewater utilities and acquire the necessary easements and right-of-way at their expense and transfer ownership of the off-site improvements to the city. The developer will be credited for the proportionate sh hydraulic share of these utility extensions that are not attributable, attribu attributable to the project with SEAC fee credits and may also be applied to the developer's utility capital expansion fees. Um, I stand uh, ready for any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you. I do have a quick question, and Councilmember uh, Long had already brought it up. Uh, when you look under uh, 8AI, uh, where it talks about an extension of wastewater force main and uh, will be on uh, Old Burnt Store Road, uh, you know, do we need to have that specific language uh, in there? Uh, you know, because to me that kind of restricts, uh, if you read, you know, if you're reading through the ordinance and you get on that particular page, that kind of restricts us. Uh, Mayor, I did speak okay. with the developer representatives and they're in agreement that we could remove the word on Old Burnt Store Road in paragraph A, little i, and paragraph A, I, I, where it talks about uh, wastewater and water. And then it would read um, one of them, like say, for instance, I, I would read an extension of potable water main to the property along a route to be determined by the city to design specifications established and provided by the city and the other one would be the same verbiage, except it would discuss wastewater force main. Okay. I guess uh, uh, that's something that uh, council will have to take uh, into consideration uh, whomever would uh, make a motion for this uh, particular uh, resolution. Uh, council Member Long. I guess to follow up on that, a question for, I guess, legal. Is there any language in here limiting um, our ability to make a decision to go up, let's just say, Burnt Store Road based on uh, cost? 
Did they have sort of an opt-out clause or is there a reasonability clause that would preclude them from accepting our recommendation to go there because of an additional amount of finance? I don't really know if there's an opt-out clause here. I don't mean an opt-out. It would just be basically like an objection clause to our decision to go up that road if it's not feasible. Can you object? Please? John Declario, yeah. City Attorney's <laughs> Office. There Okay, thank you. So then I would make a motion, I guess, to approve uh, the resolution with the uh, removal of the language that was agreed to by the developer. Second. And that's the uh, language that uh, Mr. Pearson had. Uh, Correct, that specifies the old burn store road. Right. Okay, any other discussions? Say none. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Shepard? Aye. Steinke? Aye. Welsh? Aye. Costin? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Center? Aye. Hayden? Aye. Long? Aye. Eight ayes. Motion carried. Okay, item eight is time and place of future meetings. We have a regular meeting of the Cape Coral City Council is scheduled for Wednesday, April 5th, 2023, beginning at 4.30 p.m. here in Council Chambers. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>